All right, as we're finishing up our discussion of inference, I want to point out that some of God's truths require research and careful thought to understand. That's the point that Peter's making in 2 Peter 3, uh, Ephesians 5, 17. Don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And God desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. You're not going to have everything given to you in such a clear-cut uh, way that the possibility uh, of misunderstanding isn't there. You've got to put on the old thinking cap. That's just the way God has communicated truth. <clears throat> God has provided a pattern for the church. And only by following that pattern can she be the holy bride of Christ. R. Duncan, in his work on hermeneutics, and I'm sorry that I don't have a, a year that that was published, but it's old. But he said, if some speak of it, inference, as if it were, as if it were a kind of guess, and therefore never to be used either in induction or deduction. The truth is, it is the logical effort to know the facts in the case and to ascertain the facts. <clears throat> from phenomena. <clears throat> we're not rolling dice and we're not guessing, but we're doing due diligence in examining God's word. Just like the Sadducees failed to do their due diligence in looking at passages like Exodus 3, 5, and 6. If they had, then they would have seen some truth. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't point to this one because there are so many and we don't have time. But even if we had gone down further into the, in the text of Matthew 22, we have exactly another illustration of what we were talking about. When Jesus asked the Pharisees a question... He says to them, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said, the son of David. He said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put thine enemies beneath thy feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? Now, you can have anybody in the new hermeneutic camp or in a denomination that wants to uh, throw out the old hermeneutic and say, walk me through this passage. And the only way you can walk through that passage is through inference. <clears throat> Something is being inferred, or it's being implied, and we're supposed to infer from that about the nature and character of the Christ. <clears throat> that although he comes after David chronologically, <clears throat> he is superior to David because David calls him Lord. Now how can that be? Well, the Pharisees never thought that out. But they should have. And as a result, they've got a, uh, a doctrine regarding the Messiah that was just flat out wrong. And that doctrine blinded them to seeing Jesus as the Messiah. Whereas if they had correctly understood Psalm 110 and verse 1, 
then maybe that would have opened up the door of considering Jesus from a different perspective. <clears throat> well, that's what happened. So what was the problem? Disobeying the command? No, the problem was failing to execute necessary inference from Psalm 110. Does that make sense? So, you know, as I said, we could go on and on with these. And it's not a guess. It's using logic and deduction that God expects us, Jesus expected them, Jesus expected the Sadducees to use. And he expects us to to use it. And I'll bring it to the point someone says, no, he doesn't. All right? I'm ready for you to show me the verse that says not to. I'm ready for you to show me the verse that says you are only responsible for commands. I'm, I'm ready for that. But it's not there, and I know it's not there, you know it's not there, and they know it's not there. Yeah, question? Uh, we haven't talked about it, but I, we also use this in a positive sense, right? There are some things we infer are good and right to do, not because we have an overt uh, reference to that in Scripture, but we can infer that if you're going to meet, for example, you've got to meet somewhere. And so it's fine to have a facility uh, to allow that to happen. Right. Yeah, now if, and you know, I use this illustration during the break, but if, if the command w was to, to meet by the lake, then you, you could build a building by a lake, but if you don't have a lake to build a building by, then you're... All right, let me throw this out. And this goes maybe more in the arena of example. We have an example of their meeting in an upper room. Why don't we do that? If somebody says to you... All right, you, you want to talk about example? We have an example of their eating in an upper room. Why don't we do that? I mean, that was an apostle. That was what the, the church there in Acts 20 did. Uh, so, so why don't we follow that example? Wouldn't it be the same as what we were talking about earlier, how they met daily at that, in that context? but not always? You, 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 well, you might could go there. And then a lot of different places is the point I think you're looking for. Maybe. Well, I'm looking for how do we know it's a binding example? What has to be behind the example for it to be a binding example? There has to be a command behind that example. So where's the command? There isn't one. So all you have is this is what they did. But there is no command and there is no spiritual connection. Now, if... In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul is saying something like, and this is why we meet in an upper room, because it represents our attempt to separate ourselves from the sinfulness of the world and bring ourselves closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now you've got a spiritual connection and precedent for meeting in an upper room. you got to do that. you got to do that. Uh, so all you had was an example, but then you've got this passage that per, put some spiritual significance to the example. Well, the example then becomes a command. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, but when all it is is something that they did, and there's no command behind it, and there's no spiritual significance <coughs> to it, then it is not something uh, that is binding. Okay, hopefully that, that helps a little bit. Now, some questions for those who want to throw out the hermeneutic. I, I, want, to, I want to take out the N.I. of uh, Sinai. This is, uh, and I, I know that sometimes I can maybe be a little tricky. <laughs> but I had a guy, this, this is a good friend of mine. And he's, he's a solid uh, Bible student, but he was saying, you know, I, I, I just got to tell you that I'm having some doubts about inference being a part of our hermeneutics. I'm not so sure that we're right about using hermeneutics, uh, inference. And I just said, 
Oh, wow. Okay, well, maybe we can talk about it later. Did that on purpose. We could have talked about it right then. But I, I wanted to throw something at him when he was not aware of my, uh, my trickiness. So anyway, we're, we're at lunch about an hour later. And I said, you ever run into anybody that uh, believes in infant baptism? <laughs> yeah, all the time. I said, what do you, what do you tell them? Uh, and he's, uh, you know, to try to show. He said, well, <clears throat> talk about the fact that you have to believe and you have to repent. Well, those are very adult actions. You can't expect, you know, an infant uh, to have belief. And you can't expect an infant to repent. And then I talk about the biblical examples are all those of adults that are able to confess Jesus. Anyway, you see what happened. And so then I finally said, all right, now the reason for the question. Your answer was 100% inference. You're right dead on. What you did is exactly biblical, but your answer was all inference. There is no passage that says, thou shalt not baptize. <clears throat> there is no passage that says, thou shalt only baptize adults. But what we've done is we've used logic and deduction by drawing in relevant information from the examples that we have in the New Testament to conclude that the practice of infant baptism is an unscriptural practice. Necessary inference. And we do that all the time. And you were asking about Rick actually. He does that. And they don't ever see it, that they're doing it, but they are doing it. So, questions. Is it acceptable to baptize infants? How do you know, since no passage explicitly <coughs> forbids it? A lot of the people that you speak to about this, I mean, would they go as far as to say, yeah, sure, it's acceptable to baptize. I mean, would uh, would, would this work with a lot of them or get them to think? It does get them to think. But it does not work. And the reason it does not work is because they simply do not want it to work. As I said on day one, and, and I quoted um, uh, uh, a guy now whose name just was in my mind five seconds ago. But he, he said, I think it's Roger Rush, um, those clamoring for a new hermeneutic uh, are not doing so because it doesn't work, but because it works too well. And they want so badly to have these innovative ideas and services and so on that when you present this to them, they see it, but yet they don't want to implement it. They don't want to carry it to its logical conclusion. And so it's just easier to say, you no, know, inference isn't a part of the hermeneutic. Here's one that uh, really gets them. Do you guys let women take Lord's Supper at your church? Of course. Okay, what, what verses do you use to show that that's a legitimate practice? You realize the only way that you can get to the acceptability of women predicting the Lord's Supper is through inference? When the saints assembled to break bread in Acts 27, did they also drink the fruit of the vine?
we could go on and on with these. And <clears throat> there are a lot of things that are being practiced, and, and people will argue that it's it's a biblically based practice. But they haven't really thought through what makes it a biblically based practice. Women taking the Lord's Supper or having both the, the, the bread and the fruit of the vine uh, just by looking at Acts 20. Now, how many of us in studying with somebody have used Acts 8 and the account of Philip and the eunuch when he's teaching him Jesus and then what's the very next thing he says? Look water. What prevents me from being baptized? And so you make what point from that? Preaching Jesus includes baptism. Preaching Jesus includes baptism. Now, shame on you because that's an inference. <laughs> but that is dead on logic to assume that from that context. All it says is he's preaching to him Jesus. And you want you would think that some of these guys today would go, where on earth did you get that? I'm talking about Christocentric Christianity. I didn't say anything about baptism. Where did you get that? But logic tells us that when Jesus is being preached, Baptism is being taught. Okay? That is a necessary inference from that particular passage. Anyway, um, I'm going to have to skip through some of this. Well, lots of additional subjects will let you get these down. Are children born without sin? Well, we use Matthew 19. Uh, such are the kingdom of heaven to argue uh, this particular point, but that's all inference. <coughs> Is baptism immersion? Well, we talk about, well, it's a burial from Romans 6, 4 and Colossians 2, 12. So, isn't it logical that it's immersion? You don't sprinkle a little dirt on a dead body. You don't pour a little dirt on a dead body. You bury them. Baptism is a burial. Well, that is all inference. It's all it is. But we do it. We use it all the time. Uh, just like the one I just gave, does preaching Jesus include baptism? Well, apparently it does from Acts 8. Can a woman be an elder? The Bible doesn't say she can't be. But the Bible talks about that an elder must be a husband. The unavoidable inference is that men only can be elders. Is gambling a sin? Good luck finding a verse that condemns it. But the Bible talks about covetousness. The Bible talks about being good stewards. The Bible talks about maintaining good works. Uh, and so, as we're putting the pieces together of what a Christian is and, and does, uh, we are come up with arguments against uh, gambling. Okay. Um, let's move on. Are, are there some other comments before we leave the Sini hermeneutic? Let's move on and uh, talk about some other things and uh, we're going to have to <coughs> kind of touch on uh, these in somewhat of a, of a surface way, and I'm uh, sorry about that, but it's just the nature of the beast. <clears throat> but I wanted to talk a little bit about this idea of covenant. 
covenant uh, is something that is a, a, a prevalent idea in Scripture. Uh, the word translated covenant in the, the Old Testament occurs 300 times. And the word covenant in Greek, the atheke, occurs 32 times. So this is an important concept, and it does get a fair amount of attention in uh, uh, the biblical text. So, what is it that we know or what can, that we can learn regarding hermeneutics and this idea of a covenant? Well, first of all, when we study a covenant in the Old Testament, we learn that a covenant has stipulations and has expectations. <clears throat> we also learn that there are two different types of covenants in the Old Testament. You have what is frequently referred to as a bilateral covenant. A bilateral covenant is between equals. Men with men, uh, that those bilateral covenants involve negotiation, exchange, uh, the, uh, the stipulations of the contract are adjusted accordingly as the two parties uh, negotiate with each other. Because they're equals. So you've got the Bible talking about covenant between kings, between nations, between tribes, uh, between individuals like David and Jonathan. But then we also read about a different type of covenant, which is a unilateral, or what we refer to as a unilateral covenant. A unilateral covenant is that which originates with a superior party and is given to an inferior party. The inferior party has one of two choices. Accepted as is, are rejected wholesale. But if it's a unilateral covenant, it is a non-negotiable, non-alterable, non-changeable agreement between the superior party and the inferior party. So in the Bible, when we read about these unilateral covenants. We have a lot of examples. For example, when you read the text in Genesis chapter 6, where Noah tell, God tells Noah that, <clears throat> I'm, star, I'm sorry that I made man, and I am going to uh, destroy the earth with a flood. This is what I want you to do. I want you to build an ark. I want you to build a gopher wood. I want it to be 350 feet long. I want it to be 75 feet wide. I want it to be 50 feet high. I want it to be with three levels. I want it to have uh, you know, windows all around on the top, uh, and so on. Then, if you look very carefully at the end of the instruction where God is telling Noah to build the ark, he says, Genesis 6.18, and on that day, God made a covenant with Noah. <clears throat> now, there is not one solitary verse in which God says, how does that sound? <laughs> too big, too small, uh, you don't like the pitch idea. He's saying... I'm going, to, I'm going to destroy mankind with the flood. You want to survive? Then build this. Build it this way, and you'll live. Now, you don't have to build it, and you'll die with everybody else. You want to live? Build that. That's a unilateral covenant. It is a non-negotiable, unchangeable, immutable law that comes from God. Lays it out. Another illustration. Genesis 17. In Genesis 17, the word covenant occurs 13 times in that chapter. So it is an awesome chapter to study the idea of covenant. God tells Abraham, this is the covenant that I'm making with you. Every male shall be circumcised. 
And I don't care if he's a male that was born in your house. I don't care if he's a slave. And it doesn't make any difference if he's a slave that you bought from another country or he's a slave that was a, a product of a, a man and woman slave in your house and now they have a baby. I want that baby circumcised. Every male is to be circumcised. Every male. And then here's the real kicker. In verse 14, God says, Every male among you who is not circumcised, shall be cut off from among my people. Anybody know what that means? Killed. Killed. Needs to be killed. Now I have people that say, well, I just can't believe that God would condemn someone because they haven't been immersed in a vat of water that's not the God I know. That's not the God I love. God would never, you know, you, you've been there, you've heard this. And I come back and I say, do you believe that God would condemn someone to hell because of their refusal to go through a relatively simple surgical procedure? And of course they have no idea what I'm talking about. But they're going to go, see, there's no way, there's no way God would do that. Genesis 17, 14, God says, you're not circumcised, you're not a, a part of my covenant family. Seriously? Just because, so if Abraham says, God, you know I love you, you know how committed I am to you, but I'm going to pass on the circumcision thing. <laughs> And I can come get that. You can hardly go anywhere. Yeah, hardly play God is going to say, then you can't be in my covenant family. Your mom didn't like it too well. She, yeah. <laughs> it is the nature of a covenant. A unilateral covenant is a non-negotiable. And if you understand God, then you understand the way covenants work. Now, according to Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, there is a new covenant that's coming. And he details the stipulations of that new covenant. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 8 quotes Jeremiah 31 in Hebrews 8, 8 through 12, and tells us that the new covenant is the gospel of Christ. It is a non-negotiable, non-alterable covenant that comes from God. That's the way it is. So if we understand God, then we understand that His covenants are things that we are not at liberty to change. What God says about the church, it's untouchable. It's a part of His covenant. The agreement that He's made with man. What God says about salvation, it's a covenant. It's a part of the new covenant. And it is a non-negotiable, non-changeable. Now remember, the covenant that he made with Abraham was a simple surgical procedure. But you cannot change that. You cannot change God's covenant. So, this is my point. And there's a lot more that we could say about this idea, but I think you're getting the, the gist of it. That... The New Testament, by the way, testament means covenant, but also the word for testament is also the word for covenant, which is also the word for will. Now, a will talks about inheritance, talks about the dispersal of an estate, and only those named in the will are going to receive the inheritance. 
So the New Testament is the new will of God. And so, according to the judgment scene in Revelation 20, 11 through 15, there's going to be a division, and you've got those who are going to be recipients of the inheritance. Their name is in the book of life because they lived in accordance to God's covenant. They recognized and submitted to all of the stipulations of God's covenant. Now, those that want to do away with pattern theology and they want to say that the New Testament is not a legal code completely do not understand covenant. Because in the Jeremiah 31 passage, when he's talking about the new covenant, I will put my, listen, laws in their minds and I will write them on their hearts. That's quoted in Hebrews 8. That's quoted again in Hebrews 10. Our covenant, the new covenant, has God's laws written on our hearts and on our minds. We operate with God with a legal basis. That's the way God works. All right? Any, any comments on that? All right, let's go to Romans 14. Here are some fundamental truths in understanding what's going on in Romans 14. Romans 14 might correctly be classified as the champion chapter for those wanting to do away with the old hermeneutic. So it's important that we talk about what's going on in Romans 14. First, things discussed in Romans 14 are things done by individuals, not by churches, not in public worship. All right, the first point is absolutely crucial to understanding Romans 14. Romans 14 is talking about a you and a me, never an us. And Romans 14 is talking about non-church things. Alright? Prove that. Now, don't, please don't write out the verses. Uh, we don't have time. Just put verse 2. <laughs> but look at what verse 2 says. One man has faith to eat all things, but he that is weak, another man, eats vegetables only. Alright, so this guy, one man, so we're talking about things done by individuals. Look at the language. Look at verse 2. One man sees it this way. Another man sees it that way. Verse 5. Let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. Verse 22. The faith which you have, have as your own opinion. Okay, so I believe that those verses alone prove the point. What are we talking about in Romans 14? We're talking about the way you see something versus the way I see something. Second, the things mentioned may be believed and practiced by individuals, but one sin if he requires the practice from others.
what verses would prove this point? In verse 3, after discussing the two different viewpoints of the strong in faith versus the weak in faith, Paul just makes the blanket statement, God has accepted him. And if God has accepted him, then why would you be requiring or evangelizing that person trying to convert them to your way of looking at things? Now, the two predominant topics in Romans 14 are the eating of meats and the observance of religious days. And in the, the church at Rome, you had a clear division of viewpoints on those topics. And apparently, there were those that were evangelistic in trying to get the other side to see it their way. And Paul's saying, those are not things that are a part of the church. And the fact of the matter is, God loves and accepts everybody on either side of that fence that they may be on. So if they're okay spiritually where they are, you're a meat eater, they're not, but God loves you both and God's going to save you both, leave them alone. God's accepted him. Verse 5, let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. Just settle it into where you're at on these issues. And you're fine. Whichever side of that fence you, you land on, uh, you're okay there. And don't try to get the people on the other side of the fence uh, to leave their viewpoint. Verse 13, let us not judge one another anymore. Do not put an obstacle in a brother's way. Right? We're, we're not trying to evangelize people to a particular viewpoint. Third, the things classed in Romans 14 are things which are right, and those who practice them are not to be condemned. You know, this is a classic chapter. Is it possible that you've got people that believe absolutely opposite things and both of them are okay? Is that ever a possibility? Um, well, yeah. And Romans 14 has given us examples of that. You know, uh, and this is also one of the areas that we're going to spend some time on is opinion and faith. Well, does the Bible give us any authority for holding an opinion at all yeah well where would you go to prove that right here you can have an opinion on certain topics like what's being discussed here and you should not condemn anybody who's got a different opinion why because god's accepted him paul says i know and am convinced by the lord jesus that nothing is unclean in itself all right, so Paul would have classified himself with the strong in faith, the meat-eating group. And as we're about to go to lunch, you will see that I put myself in that, <laughs> in that category. <clears throat> but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Would we be accused of pluralism because of this? Could we be? Yes. Um, by just opening up the door to believe saying, in what you believe? Right. By saying, this view is okay, this view is okay. Even though they're opposite. We I, could. Know it's, I know it's different. Yeah. Well, and, and the next point will be why, why you can't go there. Okay. So hang on. Okay. <clears throat> Verse 
The things discussed in Romans 14 are things of which the kingdom does not consist. says, verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not, and then he names the two topics, or one of the two primary topics, is not eating and drinking. So we're not talking about a kingdom thing here. The kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's, uh, those are kingdom things. We're not talking about kingdom things. So now in answer to the question, could we be accused of something that is going to lead to pluralism or is pluralistic in its nature? The answer is no. Why not? Because if it's a kingdom thing, you don't have any wiggle room. But there are some things, like what's being discussed here, that are not kingdom things, and God is allowing you in this non-kingdom thing to formulate your own view, your own opinion on this. And God's okay with that. Just settle it out in your own mind, decide where you're at on it, and then uh, live with what your conscience has decided. But if it's something that is a part of the revelation, a part of the sword of the Spirit, then it's a kingdom thing. And if God's legislated, if God's spoken, then you don't have a right to have your own opinion. So kingdom things have to do with church matters and divine legislation. One more point. <clears throat> the things discussed in Romans 14 are to be determined by one's conscience. They're not divine mandates. God hasn't legislated. I guess I'm just thinking that uh, a person who violates his conscience, he may not see that so much as a matter of opinion. If I eat something, you know, a particular type of food, in his own, in his own mind it's a sin, so to him, to him it's not an opinion. Right. And for someone you know, that understands that you know, there's nothing wrong with eating any kind of food, um, you know, he's, he's, from your perspective, that's an opinion. Yeah, and that's why, you know, he talks about, see, you've got um, the strong in faith, which are the, the day observers and the meat eaters. The way they looked at the weak in faith was they were looking down on them, condescending, you're weak. Uh, and the weak in faith were doing what you're talking about. They were judging the strong. Where's your Bible verse that says you can do that? Where's your authority to observe special days? You don't have any. So you're uh, you're sinning. And that's why he uses the word crino. You're 
you're they're ju- being judged as involve themselves in sinful behavior, and Paul's going, whoa, let's reel this back a little bit and recognize, first of all, that uh, we're talking about non-kingdom things. We're talking about things in which God is allowing you to have a perspective on both sides of this fence, and, and you're fine. And Paul does say, now I know and am convinced that all things are clean. I can, I can go ahead and eat meat. But to see this as, and I need to now convince you to see it the same way. As I, you've got, let's say, this Gentile that grew up in a, uh, a pagan environment. They, uh, they were taught by mommy and daddy that as they eat this meat, this is meat that uh, has been offered to the gods. And so by eating this meat, we're worshiping uh, those great gods that have given us these blessings. And now that they're a Christian and they know the truth and they know about the one great God, I just can't do that. I've got so much baggage that I, I just can't. And, okay, uh, Paul's saying through inspiration, and that's okay. That's okay for you to go ahead and, and say, you know, I just can't. And uh, God's okay with that. Because, as he says in verse 6, everybody is doing what they're doing uh, for the Lord. They're trying uh, to please the Lord. <laughs> All right, so to prove this fifth point, <clears throat> they're not divine mandates because he says in verse 14, the one that thinks it is unclean, to him it is. And then verse 22, the faith that you have, have as your own opinion. God tells Peter, don't call what I've, well, no longer consider as unclean as what what I've sanctified or made holy. Is Paul saying, um, well, for, well, I guess this would be an example of where it's okay for, for them to do that, to still consider it as unclean. Yeah, but... The, I think the key to this really is verse 6, because where they're settling themselves uh, on this is is for the Lord. And uh, they're, they're not just doing it because they're, they're wanting to be stubborn or obstinate or, you know, you're a Jew and I don't like Jews, and so I'm going to... Um, in their own mind, as they talk about the practical uh, implications of their faith, they're just saying, this is... The, the way I see it. You know, modern day topics like this might be something like Christmas. You've got some people that, that I just can't go there. You know, it's got a pagan background. You know, the Bible doesn't uh, say that, okay, fine. Uh, you don't think you should uh, have a special day. That's fine. But there might be somebody on the other side of the fence that said, you know, I. I think uh, taking a special day and acknowledging the birth of Christ and singing songs that celebrate his uh, birth into this world, I I just want to do that. Uh, okay, well, I think that would fit into the discussion in, in Romans 14. You've got people on both sides uh, of it. Um, we've got a, a woman at Bear Valley that believes that it would be sinful, literally sinful, for her to wear pants, ever. And so she does not own a single pair of pants. Now, uh, if, you know, uh, should we try to evangelize her to the foolishness of that view? Uh, no, that's, that's the way she sees that. That's the way she uses like a passage in 1 Corinthians 11 and how God wants there to be a division of the sexes. She's... Uh, apply that to the clothing that she wears, and uh, in this culture, men don't wear dresses. So, uh, nor do we intend to. 
okay. So, um, or there's another guy that absolutely is not going to take alcohol in any way, shape, or form. So he's not going to have NyQuil. He's not going to go to Applebee's and uh, get uh, a Bourbon Street steak. Uh, said, well, all the alcohol is cooked out of it. I don't care. I, I feel like I'd be sinning against God uh, if I have alcohol in any, any form whatsoever. Right? So are we to say, let me tell you how dumb that is. No, I mean, it's, he's got a right uh, within that to uh, formulate. Now, uh, does the Bible speak to these issues? Yeah. Did the Bible speak to meats being clean? Yeah. But even within that, uh, you you had the right to move to maybe a more conservative way of looking at these things, and God was still okay with that. God's saying, I'm okay with your going this far. And you say, well, I, I don't want to go that far. I, I'd like to stop short of that. God's saying, I'm perfectly fine with that. But what God doesn't allow is for us to go beyond beyond that. So that's kind of an answer to, to your question. Now, th- here here is what I, I want to throw out to you and uh Turn, turn in your Bibles to Romans 14. And I want to do with verse 3 what those that uh, want to use Romans 14 to champion uh, their views do. Tell me what's wrong with what, what they're doing. All right, verse, chapter 14, verse 3. Let not him who worships with an instrument regard with contempt him who does not worship with an instrument. And let not him who does not worship with an instrument judge him who does worship with an instrument, for God has accepted him. Yes, it is a kingdom thing. That's why that doesn't fit Romans 14. God has spoken in regard to worship. It's a kingdom thing. And so that doesn't fit in Romans 14. What else? Church thing, not an individual thing. Yeah. Romans 14 is talking about what you do versus what I do. It's never talking about an us. And when we're talking about instrumental music and worship, now it's an us thing. It's, so it's a kingdom thing in, as far as legislation is concerned, but it also doesn't fit Romans 14 because Romans 14 is talking about a you versus me, not an us. But there's one other thing that I found that those that want to use Romans 14 to, to support the practice of instrumental music is this. If you're really going to use Romans 14, and for the sake of argument, I would allow the topic to fall into the Romans 14 bucket. You still couldn't use it. I had one guy goes, well, why not? Sure I could. And I said, no, here's why you couldn't still use it. Because Paul says, verse 15, For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. So I'll say, allow me, if you don't mind, to revise these verses. For if because of the instrument your brother is hurt, You are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your instrument him for whom Christ died. Verse 20. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of your instrument. 
So if you even were going to allow that to fall into the Romans 14 bucket, you still can't use it. Because you were not to flaunt or exercise what you believe to be your Christian liberty in front of someone that that would violate their conscience. The strong yielded to the weak. So, either way you go, you can't use the instrument. Yeah. I read an article in Wineskins. It was an interview with Rick Ashley about how to successfully get the instrument in there. But he mentioned one of the things that they did was they hired a consultant to kind of help them through the process with you know, damage control. And uh, he said they were expecting about a 30% initial loss of membership, but then over the course of a couple of years to be able to duplicate. But I was thinking, you know, if it is just an opinion matter, why in the world would you do something that's immediately going to alienate 30% of the members to where they're forced to leave? And uh, I think that would go along. That, that goes along with perfectly with what we're saying. Paul would say, no, don't do that. Don't, don't be, you know, bullheaded and, and press forward on something that you know is going to make 30% of your membership uh, fall away. That would be like saying, I have no need of you, which we said you can't do in First Corinthians 12. Yeah, so. that's exactly right. So. Well, what do we do when non-institutional brethren use that same argument on us? When we're talking about something that is or isn't a kingdom thing. And, and that's generally uh, the problem that we've had is... You know, you're you're wanting to bind something, but uh, you know, like the idea of not supporting uh, another institution. Well, first of all, we're talking about an us, uh, so it doesn't fit in Romans 14. Uh, second of all, does the New Testament address the idea of one church being involved in the a work of another church? Yeah, it does. Therefore, we've got precedent. And what they're trying to do is narrow it down to it only can be for this. Uh, but as we were talking about before in the arena of biblical example, if you have a church that is helping the work of another church in helping the poor, helping a ministry, maybe helping uh, a church su support a minister, then now you're just seeing the principle being established that you can helping that church as long as it's a you know God approved work it doesn't have to be narrowed just in one area do you think there would be a possible situation where you could kind of divvy up the money from the congregation say you have 25% who contribute but they don't feel that the church can do that so maybe with their money you don't use it that way and with 75% who think you can do that I mean would you think there are ways you can work around that with them yeah. having differing views to still be united? Some of you may remember this. Uh, I was a part of what was called the Nashville meeting. Uh, most people are aware of the Arlington meeting because of the book that was uh, produced from that, uh, in which the, uh, um, the institutional and the non-institutional brethren got together and uh, had a, uh, a debate, and that was published in the book called the Arlington meeting, Arlington, Texas. Well, we did the same thing in the 80s. Uh, called the Nashville meeting, and I was a part of that. And in that particular meeting, those of us on the institutional side just said, look, why don't we just agree to no longer support these places out of the church treasury? If, if for the sake of peace and for the sake of unity and for the sake of harmony, if we just said, all right, we're going to go back to our churches and we're going to say from this point forward, there is no money that's going to be taken out of the church treasury and sent to Mountain States Children's Home. Would that be something that where we could, we could be at peace and we could uh, be united? And their answer blew us away. They said, no, that wouldn't work because you have to believe that it's wrong. Wow. <laughs> Not just, you know, not doing it, but you have to believe that. You know, and I couldn't help but think, wow, because I suspect in every single one of your churches, you've got people there that 
they really do believe it'd be okay to work with an okay. instrument. But they're sitting side by side, and they're singing a cappella, and they're not going to create a snake. But in their personal viewpoint, they're thinking, you know, I, I, I really don't have a problem. If, if we're going to get to the point where everybody has to believe exactly the same, then, uh, you know, talk about drawing your circle more and more narrow, uh, then we're really got a problem. So, anyway, uh, an, an attempt to, to provide unity was, was offered, but it wasn't, it wasn't good enough. Is this kind of like the woman who says, man, it's really a violation of my conscience <coughs> to wear pants. I mean, I just think that's so disrespectful to God. But I'll, you know, I'll do that for myself, but I'll allow others to do it um, for the sake of harmony. I mean, in a sense, it's like, okay, this is her conviction. I mean, she's, I mean, very sure she's right about it, but at the same time, she's allowing others to to choose something differently and but we'll still sit down in the same pew with them she'll sit beside a woman who you know who has a, a pants on in the service I mean she'll hold them and care for them and love yeah. them and do everything that a Christian does not isolate herself from them um, yeah and that's the kind of attitude that Paul's talking about in Romans 14 she is not saying they're lost yeah. she's not suggesting that they're lesser of a Christian she's doing what she's doing for the Lord in her way of demonstrating her devotion to God, that's kind of how she's navigating through that. And, you know, I say kudos to her. You know, I like that. Just like the guy who says, you know, I'm going to stay away from alcohol in any way, shape, or form. I just don't even want to, to get close to it. Say, well, you know, I, I've i been known to take some NyQuil from time to time. So I'm, I'm not where... He is, that, but I respect that, and he's not condemning uh, somebody that's going to go get a steak that was marinated in in wine, but it was all cooked out. He's not going to do that. Uh, so, anyway, no other comments? Yeah, it's interesting. I I have some history, family history with the uh, non-institutional, and it's interesting how they will apply that Romans 14 argument to us. But then the group within their group that's even more restrictive than them will apply the Romans 14 argument against them. As yeah. Well. yeah. Oh, Brother Petrillo, uh, Paul is certainly promoting a spirit here in this chapter and an attitude that needs to be uh, you know, manifested. You know, there's, there's also a consideration for these guys who want to try to plug instrumental music into this argument. The fact that behold, this comes out and says it's right. You know, I think that's your third point that you gave us. He just says it's right to eat me. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, he just very explicitly states that that's it's fine. You know, so in, in essence, he is trying to teach. Yeah. You know, that weaker brother. I think you know that it's nothing wrong with eating meat. And I think the reason for that is because they were judging the meat eaters as being sinful. Right. And Paul says, well, you need to reel that back. Mm -hmm. uh, it's right. It's okay for them to do that. Yeah, and so that's that attitude to do. We know it's there, but I guess have, what I'm saying is can we just tell those who try to plug instrumental music in here that, you know, God no, nowhere ever says the instrumental music is right in the New Testament words, nor does he imply it, you know. Yeah. And so it's apples and oranges that you're trying to compare. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't fit here. It doesn't fit in the discussion of Romans 14 at all. All right, other comments? I think instrumental music is not also not the same situation as where the person eating meat feels like he's sinning. I don't know of anyone that feels like they're sinning because they don't sit with an instrument. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's not, a, that's not a matter of conscience there either. So. Yeah. All right, let's talk a little about uh, uh, culture. We have uh, already addressed some of this when we were talking about um the holy kiss, the washing of feet, the, the wearing of the, uh, the veil. Here are some, uh, some fundamental principles, and I don't have this on the PowerPoint, so uh, get, get what you want in your, in your notes. But we have to understand, first of all, the Bible does function within the framework of a culture.
like the Bible talks about setting a good example. But yet, a good example is not fully defined in Scripture. Like, if you let out a huge belch in public, that, in this culture, is, yeah. But, if you let out a huge belch in Scotland, that's the greatest compliment to the cook you can give. Well, so, setting a good example is something that is going to be culturally influenced at some level. Do that which is right in the eyes or in the sight of all men, Romans 12, 17. So, we are supposed to put on our hermeneutical thinking caps and determine what in a particular time and culture is deemed good, acceptable behavior and then try to fit within the mold of that particular culture. That's an expectation that we have. Paul is saying the same thing in 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23, when he says, When I'm with Jews, I act like Jews, and when I'm with Gentiles, I act like Gentiles. I want to win them to the gospel, and I do not want my conduct to be something that is so stubbornly Jewish that I'm going to turn off the Gentiles from hearing me on the crucial matter of the gospel. Second point, we've got to understand that the Bible transcends and occasionally overrides culture. If you are a card player, you might say trumps culture. For example, I just got back from a culture that it's acceptable for a man to have multiple wives. That's the norm. And uh, nearly every Maasai man has multiple wives. And that's the way it's been for centuries. Well, that doesn't make it right. The Bible does transcend and override cultural norms. And it's going to trump that practice. In our society, abortion has become acceptable. It's a part of our culture. But that doesn't make it right. Homosexuality. Uh, but that doesn't make it right. There's no way God is going to approve of it, whether... It's a part of culture or not. How then are you able to determine what God allows and what God vetoes? Let me suggest quickly four general principles. First, if it's a universal principle... then it overrides culture. Acts 2.39, Peter notes that the promise of forgiveness when one repents and is baptized is for you and your children and for all who are far off. So, that language demonstrated a universal principle. So it is not something that's going to be culturally bound just by the nature of the language. In Acts 17.30, Paul says that God is now declaring to all men everywhere to repent. Well, that sounds pretty universal. So if a culture has a non-penitent body of people, too bad. God's saying, you're going to have to repent. I don't care what your cultural norm is. All right, second general rule. The T 
teaching is binding if it's based on a timeless principle. For example, in Genesis 9, 6, God decreed that man put to death another man that murdered. The rationale for capital punishment is found in the phrase, for in the image of God, he made man. That is a timeless principle. Man is made in the image of God. That's true to, as true today as it was on day five, day six that God created man. So the teaching should stand, even though it's Old Testament, even though it's Genesis 9. It is stated in a timeless, fundamental principle about the man being in the image of God. Jesus, in Matthew 19, based his strict teachings on marriage, divorce, and remarriage on a principle rooted in the creation. He brought the Pharisees back to Genesis 2 and 3 in order to establish God's divine, timeless principle for marriage and divorce. Sorry, what are the verses again? Matthew 19, 3 through 6. Third general rule about culture is that the teaching is binding if it's based in nature. <clears throat> so the first one is a universal principle, the second one is a general rule. It's timeless. <clears throat> the third is if it's based in nature. Romans 1, 27, 26 and 27, Paul notes that homosexuality is a violation of what God has set up in nature. Nature teaches that it's man with woman, not man with man. In Galatians 4, 8, Paul says that the Galatians were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. So, it doesn't make any difference if the culture says they are gods, nature says they're not gods. Other passages that uh, we could appeal to, uh, James 3, 7, Romans 11, 21, 1 Corinthians 11, 14, And then fourth, a teaching transcends culture when it establishes principles that conflict with the cultural belief or practice of the time. It establishes principles that conflict with the cultural belief Our practice of the time. In other words, you know, you've got a universal principle because of the words like everywhere. It's a timeless principle because you've got words like uh, always uh, and then the word nature is the key word uh, with the third principle. And then the fourth one is if you see something that just absolutely butts right against what we know to be the cultural norm. Case in point. First Timothy chapter 2. Women are in a culture where, are in a city where they're used to being large and in charge. But 
women are told to not be teachers, told to be silent. Uh, well, that butted against what was in a Gentile city uh, a, a norm. Well, that's going to transcend culture. But we have to recognize that we like to let culture trump Scripture rather than the other way around. And that's why we're dealing with, in hermeneutics, the problem of people that are saying, yeah, but in the 21st century, man, women are gifted. Women have great ability. Women can preach. Women can teach. Women can lead singing. And so now we're wanting it to be the other way around. We're wanting culture to trump scripture. Modern man, there, acapella is just not the world that we live in. We don't listen to that uh, music on the radio, uh, and that's just not what people like. It's not what people want. And so why are we trying to cram a music that people don't like or want down their throat Sunday after Sunday? Well, that's letting culture trump scripture rather than the other way around. All right, we've got to quit. It's time. Uh, so what I need is for you guys to tell me if you settled in on a topic, and if so, what that topic is. Um, David Fang, do you know what you want to write your paper on yet? Uh, culture. John? Calder? Um, about the uh, New Testament author's use of the Old Testament. And you mean specifically uh, in what re related to hermeneutics? How are yes. you looking at that? Uh, I'm not sure yet. I, I, I've been, uh, okay, just make I'm sure. Talking. Yeah, let's communicate on that. Make sure that it fits. Uh, with hermeneutic. Uh, Terrence? Uh, it's going to be something to do with uh, how the redefining terms are necessary to the new hermeneutic. For the new hermeneutic? Or yes. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, they have to redefine terms to make their argument sound legitimate. Fred? Ephesians 5, Romans 3. I mean, Colossians 3. Philip, necessary inferences. Joey, something with examples. Barry, pass for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> now, you don't have to decide right now. I'm only asking, really, for the guys that uh, that already know. But you need to let me know. You know, like within the next couple of weeks, uh, kind of where where you're settling. But you can you can do a pass right now if you need to. Derek, silence of the scriptures. Brian, um, maybe maybe something on Romans 14. Good. Travis, can I email you? Uh, yeah, sure can. Anthony, fellowship. Good. Chuck, changing cover. Kevin? Uh, the place of historical reconstruction in the application of Scripture. That sounds too fancy for me. <laughs> Joey? The function of chiasms in the Gospel of John. Um... Okay, maybe kind of shoot me a, a, a synopsis on how how you're wanting to apply that to home and use. Okay, Bill. Yeah, I want to be one on covenants too. Okay, the relationship to home. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for Thank you. Uh, being a part of this class. I hope you found it to be helpful and useful and. That there's some stuff that you can take with you, and certainly in four days there's a lot that we couldn't cover. But, uh,
years and things that would be useful. Yes. Do you have any information on the proper application or the practical application of the Old Testament law within the New Covenant? As far as people want to say, well, you have to get married after you get pregnant or else you're sinning and the child will be a bastard. I don't. I'm not aware of anything that I have. Thank you. 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 Thank